Hey, this is the McGuire Review, and today we're going to be taking a look at Pillars of Eternity, Lords of the Eastern Reach. And I am really excited to uh, take a look at this one. I've been waiting for this game for a long time. This is a Kickstarter. I am a huge fan of the computer game. So, Pillars of Eternity, the actual computer game, it's been out for a while. They got a couple expansions. Uh, they made a card game based on that successful computer game, and I think they've done an excellent job. You can see there's a ton of, of stuff that's included in the game. We're going to go through all of this, and then we're going to take a look at what you know a high-level uh, game turn looks like, what kind of mechanics you're going to run into. I've got a, kind of a two-player setup set up here that I was playing through. Uh, and having a great time. So this one's from Zero Radius Games and Obsidian Entertainment. It is a 14 plus one to four player. I remind you, one to four player, so you can solo this bad boy, and 60 to 120 minutes. And that's another reason why I really, really like this game is because you can do a solo adventure. They do include some rules that kind of tweak out things, you know, a little bit to make it to make it a better solo experience. Let's get into the components. And what I'm going to do is I'll start here with the rule book. We've got the Lords of the Eastern Reach rule book, and you can see it's a it's a very nice rule book. It's not too long; doesn't take too long to read through. Great color and picture and examples throughout that throughout the rule book. And one thing that I really like that they did is they included some nice uh, combat. Uh, examples you'll see right here and those really really help when you're kind of thinking through the details of how some of these cards work and how combat works um, I found that reading those those combat examples answered almost every question that I had about combat so I highly suggest you read those read those examples in the book the next thing we're gonna have here is when you start the game everyone's gonna actually have one of these base cards here and it's got some nice artwork on the back of the actual land and then on the front it actually has a character with an ability and then it lists off your building total and your 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 troop total and, and I'll have some pictures here up close at the end there's a little apple that represents how much you know how many troop cards how many army cards you can have and, and then a little house that represents how many buildings you can actually build and those numbers can be modified throughout the game with various cards that you that you obtain now another thing about these cards is one side is what they consider a generic side where it's eight buildings and five troop size and that's for everybody so if you want more of that euro style feel kind of keep the keep the playing field equal you could you could decide that everybody plays with just the generic side um, I like playing with the other side because the other side actually has a character and a special ability so you kind of shuffle these up and each person gets one of these random um, and that's kind of your special ability for the game and uh, your troop size as, as well as your building size will be a little bit different and I found that this is pretty balanced with these cards so I would suggest playing with the characters and the, and the various powers We'll start right up here, and you'll see that there is a quest deck. So as you play the game, you're going to start with two quests. There's main quests that are revealed at the very end of the game. There's also these quests called tasks, which you can just go ahead and reveal them right up, uh, right up front once you gain them. And uh, there, there are things like there might be a, a certain monster that's in a deck, and once that monster's been defeated, you complete that quest and that task. And then you can take another quest. So it's just another way to get victory points throughout the game as you play. Because at the end, when the game's over, you're going to add up all your victory points. And that's going to be with buildings. That's going to be with uh, loot you've obtained. That's going to be with monsters you've killed, quests you've completed. And you're going to add up all those victory points. And the, and the person with the highest victory points is, is the victor. The next thing we have here is the Hirelings deck. If you have an in or a stronghold that you're able to build in the gameplay, then for one gold, when it's your turn, you're able to go to this Hirelings deck and actually hire uh, one more individual into your troop. And it's much like you know uh, any other troop that you would get from the city deck we'll get to here in a second, um, but you know that every single one of these cards is a troop. So that's the benefit to going to this deck for one gold. Uh, you, can, you know you can just pick up a troop. The next deck we have here is the city deck. As you can see, this is the rest of the city deck. So the city deck is actually um, that big <laughs> with these discarded cards that we have here. So the city deck is, is enormous, and there's a reason for that. Um, when you start the game, you can shuffle these all up, and there's various different lengths to gameplay. So if you want a short game, just use half of the deck. 
If you want a normal game, use three-fourths of the deck. If you want a long game or an epic game, use the entire deck. And how the game actually ends, the game is over when the city deck runs out. Now, once the city deck runs out, let's say it's on the first player's turn of that, of that, of that round, it means there's only one more round to go, but hey, there's no more cards. All you do is whatever cards you set aside at the beginning of the game, you grab those and you just use those for the remainder of that round, and then it's done. It's over. That, so that's kind of the game clock. That's the counter or the doom counter to this game is the city deck. So you're going to be watching that deck as cards are drawn, discarded as it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. That's going to kind of offset your strategy and where you are in the game because you know when the game is going to end. It's all based on that city deck. And I like that mechanic. Um, here you'll see uh, we've just got some discards as you use city cards, whether it's troops that get destroyed during combat, we'll explain that here in a second, or it's uh, buildings that might get destroyed, or you might have to destroy a building or a unit based on an ability on a card. That's going to go to your discard pile right here for the city deck. Now, you'll notice that we've got three different uh, decks in the middle here, and all these are is they're the dungeon decks. So you got dungeon one, two, and three. Now that's one type of encounter for a game, or they included another one here, which is the wilderness. And that's a, a, a whole nother deck that uh, you can replace instead of the dungeon. So at the beginning of the game, you'll, you'll select, okay, do we want to go to the wilderness or do we want to do the dungeons? Now, you may ask, okay, uh, can I do both? I, I don't know. Maybe you could if you wanted to. In the rule set, it does indicate you either select the dun the, the one, two, and three deck for the dungeon, or you select the wilderness. I but you know, I mean if you're gonna play like a really long epic game and use, you know, all the city cards, if you're gonna play a full scale epic game, play every card in the game, and you wanted to set out the wilderness as well, I don't know, maybe you could do that. Um I don't know. You guys put in the comments below if anybody else has done it and you've tried that, see how it works. Uh, but it does indicate to choose one or the other. So for this example, we've gone with the dungeon. And every time it's your turn, you'll you'll decide, do I go with uh, dungeon level 1, dungeon level 2, dungeon level 3? Obviously, those getting harder as you work up through the decks. And each one of the decks has got loot in it. It's got monsters. There's various pets that you can pick up. You'll see this little... This little uh, pig meeple here, and this is from the computer game as well. It was something from the Kickstarter for the computer game. It's like this little ethereal pig pet that kind of you can get and follows you around, sort of looks starry and it's transparent. And I and I thought they did a really nice job with this because it is a it is a wooden you know, um, it is a little wooden piece, but they actually put this kind of a metallic glittery paint job on it. You're not going to be able to see that on camera, but. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I haven't I haven't seen a, a game component come like that in other in other games. They put kind of a metallic sparkly paint on it. So I thought that was neat to kind of kind of you know to make it look like the 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 animal or the pet looks in the game. You'll also notice we have three tokens here, and these are other pets that you can get. There's kind of like a wolf. There's a, there's a lion, and then again there's that little uh, that little pig. So when you get the pig, you can actually you, know, you take the token. Um, but if you if you did the Kickstarter, you've all, you also got this included as well. So that's cool. And it does stand up by itself, so that's pretty neat. Uh, if we move on here, you'll notice we've got a few uh, dice, and there's actually four. There's one over one over here. There's four that come with the game. Two kind of a pinkish color, pinkish red, and then two that are like a, a nice um, yellow. And they do have that uh, pearl kind of pearl white that goes through all of them. So there's some really nice little little dice and you'll use that. Various cards have a have a die on it and tell you, hey, roll a die and depending on what the roll is, this action will happen. Um, sometimes for defense, for attack, sometimes for a various ability. So that's all these dice are really included in the game for and they are just your standard uh, uh, D6s. So you can replace those with any D6 that you have uh, if there's a special die that you want to replace that with. What you'll find right up front here is an ability that the chanters have called Invocation. And uh, in the game, as well as the computer game, there's a, there's a character that sort of reads off these chants, and, and the chants give various abilities, whether it's defense or attack for the party. And uh, that's what this little, this little token here is for. When you get that type of unit, you'll put that token on that unit's card. And you can actually exhaust the unit and, and use that, and it will give you 
plus two to attack, plus one to armor, or a reroll. So it's a pretty powerful little token. And if you ever want to get those back on the chanters, if they don't get destroyed within a combat round, you can do that one of two ways. Either one, you can, after uh, the chanter goes, goes back and is exhausted and it's the next turn, next round, um, you can get that back, or you can actually exhaust one of your troops that stayed behind, stayed back at the uh, kind of your fort and didn't go into battle. You could exhaust one of those one of those troops uh, and immediately get get that token back. So there's a couple of different ways to get that back. What you'll see up here are the actual resources in the game that you'll use as you go through the game. And you know, there's various different types: gold, hammers, money bags, uh, and and this little nice velvet bag they included. Um, it's actually a really nice little bag is what they will go in and every time we go around a game turn you know you'll you'll go in you'll select five of these resources by default and there are some cards that will allow you to get more resources uh, in the game when it's your turn to draw resources and you'll pull those out you'll draw your five so say one two uh, three four five and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at those symbols and we'll have uh, we'll always have a deck of cards in our hand, and generally that's always going to be five cards in your hand as well. Again, unless you have something in the game, some kind of ability that increases that hand size, you'll always be holding five cards in your hand. Uh, so when it's your turn, you pull your resources. You'll be able to spend those resources, and every one of these cards you'll see over here to the side have images of those of those resources and it's it's kind of small it's over here on the side we'll have pictures of the at the at the end here and you're able to spend these resources to essentially play and purchase these cards those might be troops those might be buildings that you'll be putting into play when it's your turn there's also a very interesting mechanic um, when we when you do the resource phase that we'll we'll explain here in a second now the last component that I'm gonna go over um, is actually the these little um, purple they call them soul gems they're nice little purple crystal gems that are in the game and those are used to actually attach to various troops uh, in the game when when you're when you're playing when you go into combat there's actually little symbols on the cards that say hey if you have one of these little crystals on it you can activate a certain power and if the troop is des destroyed you do lose uh, the little crystal gem unless it's indicated on the card that you would not and sometimes you roll a die and if you roll a certain um, you know number on that die you may lose the crystal but otherwise once it's attached and assigned to the card it stays in play and it stays attached to the card now the card may exhaust and go back come in come out of play that that soul gem crystal is still always attached to that card unless the card is destroyed or there's something on the card that indicates you would lose the soul gem so they I thought that was a nice little addition to the cards to kind of add sort of a little one-up or kind of a power to to various cards depending on what they do let's get into a game round there are included two reference sheets now um, I gotta kind of ask I'm, I'm not sure where there's two if it's a four-player game you would think they would have included four of these but they did not and I actually thought it was an error when I when I pulled it out of the box uh, but I did check the rule book and the components, and you are only supposed to get two. Why two? I, I, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, you can share these. It's not that big of a deal. I think it would have been nice if they would have included four. But here on the back, you've got your common abilities. So it goes through each one of the main abilities in the game. And these are the things that you're going to find on the cards. Items like... Uh, evasive, what does that do? Fear, focus, fury, invocation, long shot, random encounter, revenge. So there's a few other that are on here, but it lists out right on the card exactly what that does so you don't have to remember. But seriously, after a few game rounds, you'll start to see these, these keywords pop up and you'll see what people do with them. It doesn't take very long to memorize the, you know, the 10 or so that are on this list of what they do and how they interact with the game. But if you can't remember, Bam. Bam! There you got your reference sheet. You can you can pull that up. On the other side, you'll have your turn sequence. You'll have what happens at the end of a round, and you'll have the layout of what combat looks like. So let's talk about a turn sequence really quick. So you're going to have the start of turn. The first thing that you're going to decide as a player, and we'll just say this is my player here, the first thing that you're going to decide is... Um, if you want to go into combat and you don't have to do that it's not it's not required 
And let's say that you didn't have very many um, heroes. So for instance, for this setup, I've got my main card here we talked about. So here's my main character. And that character uh, just happens to have a bunch of these soul gems right now. So that's kind of my main home base. I've kind of hoarded those up. I've got a couple quests right here. I've got one building. It's a stable. And I've got this little loot pile of, uh, of monsters that I've defeated. I've got my hand of cards. And I've got three heroes here. Um, well, I'm sorry. I have one hero technically and, and two other troops. So there are differences in your troops some of them are considered actual heroes and they have a special mark on them to indicate that and they don't exhaust either once they're used. And the other types of troops are just kind of your basic uh, combat troop that can be destroyed and exhausted. And um, you, But you want to hang on to those heroes. You want to keep them, keep them protected. There are certain items in the game that only can be used by heroes. And I have that here as well. I found this shield in the dungeon and it indicates that the shield can only be used by this hero. So I have it attached to this hero. So at this point, I'm going to decide, do I have enough forces to kind of take on a combat, whether it's me trying to attack another player or me trying to attack the dungeon? And I have three I have three people here, so that's probably enough to attack. So what I would do is I would decide, do I want to attack dungeon level one, two, or three? And it's early in the game. I'm probably going to want to stick with dungeon level one. So I'm going to take that dungeon card. I'm going to flip it over, and I'm going to look at the card. Now, some of them... Um, have an ability that immediately makes me have to draw another card. Or let's say I draw a loot. If you draw a loot, you continue to draw cards until you get a monster card. And then what you do is you kind of set that loot down and you put that monster on top of it. And once you defeat that monster, then you can claim the loot that's under it. So it is really cool if it's your turn and you're like, you draw a card, oh, it's a loot card. You draw another card, ah, oh, it's another loot card. You draw a third card, oh, okay, it's a monster. Because once you defeat that monster, you get to claim both of those loot cards. But you can't just take loot without beating a monster, unless it's the last card in the deck. So if, if it's the last card in the deck and it's a loot card, you can just go ahead and take that, and that would be that would be your combat round. Um, so for instance, on this one, I I drew uh, I drew this black ooze, and all the artwork on the actual monster cards, or at least these dungeon cards so far, has been kind of a black and white type of artwork. The artwork on the the various buildings and all of the um, characters and troops are all in color. But I notice these are just in black and white, um, and I actually kind of like that variation. I think it looks really good, and it's got a few key words on here. Like this one has evasive, so. Uh, any troops that don't have ranged attack um, actually will lose one of their attack points. So on every one of these cards, your troops, you have a uh, you have actually an attack value that's here at the top uh, over here, and then you have a defense value, and then you have an ability down here that they're capable of doing. Um, and then, uh, you know, for this one, this is a craftsman. He actually gives me plus one on my on my buildings. So if I have, as long as I have him in my possession, I can I can have uh, more buildings than what I normally would be able to have and start out with. So you can see there's quite a few different things that are on the cards that kind of indicate what they do. Uh, and then I, I would essentially play out the combat. And how the combat actually works is. It's kind of simultaneously with defense and attack. So the first thing I'm going to do is determine what is the attack value of this card. Well, it says uh, it's worth one victory point. It has one attack value and has three defense. And I could read here it's evasive. If the party does not include at least one ranged character, Black Ooze gains attack plus two. Well, all right, I'm going to look at my party. Okay, I, I include, actually, I have two ranged characters, so we're good to go there. And uh, my craftsman is the only person that isn't ranged. And remember, evasive only takes the combat, the attack value down by one if you don't have ranged. But uh, his attack value is actually zero, so it doesn't affect him. My hero here has ranged, so she's good to go. And my chanter here has ranged, so he's good to go. So its attack value is one. My attack value is one, two, three. Okay, uh, its defense is three, my attack is three, so I can beat it, so it's kind of been defeated. Now the damage it does against me is one damage, and I have one defense and four defense, so I actually have uh, five um, defense, 
and I have this plus one armor. So armor is very uh, different than defense in this game, and it's very important. Armor actually blocks the incoming damage that's coming into you. Because I have this plus one armor and it only does one damage, um, I don't have to get rid of any cards. I can just go ahead and beat this monster, claim it, um, take it, put it in my loot pile, and then exhaust the cards that were used. So in this instance, uh, I did use the Chanter. I would exhaust the Chanter. Heroes do not exhaust. That's their special ability. They don't have to exhaust. And I didn't really technically use the Craftsman, so I would just pull him back as well. And when you exhaust, what that means is for the rest of that game round, as you're going around the table, until it gets back to you again, then you can activate that character. It just kind of, it basically means you've used the character for that round, and it's kind of out of play. Okay? So... Here's what would happen if I didn't have that armor. If I didn't have that armor, I would need to I would need to get rid of that one damage. And you actually burn cards to do that. So I would look at my cards and I would say, well, my craftsman has three. I only have to get three defense. I only have to get rid of one. And it doesn't work as in, oh, well, I have three and I only have to get rid of one. It's no, it's like you have to get rid of a card. Well, it may be best in this situation with this Chanter. The Chanter has one defense. I have to get rid of one attack. So I could just kill and and I could just kill that Chanter. But Chanters are really powerful. So maybe I just get maybe I want to get just get rid of my craftsman, because my craftsman is really just a defense tank. But he gives me the plus one building limit. And I that might be important to me right now. So let's say I just get rid of the Chanter. I would uh, discard my little token here and I would discard my Chanter. I have now taken care of that one damage, and I can now claim this card. Again, that would only be the case if I didn't have this item that gives me the plus one armor, and I do. So that's not how that actually would play out. Okay, that's combat. The next thing we're going to do is draw resources. This is when we're going to take the bag and we're going to draw our five resources out. And then we're going to decide, we're going to look at our hand of cards, and we're going to decide what we want to build and what we want to do with, the, with our resources. Now, here's the, a really cool mechanic uh, in this game that that uh, I really like. Once you use the resources, and, and let's say you couldn't use them all. You look at your hand, you're like, okay, I can use the gold, I can build something, and I can use these two bags and these two uh, hammers, and I can I can build a building, right? But I don't, I can't really do anything with these two single bag uh, tokens here. If that's the case, what happens is then you pick up those resources and you pass them to the player on, on the left, you pass them clockwise. And then that player gets an opportunity. It's not even their turn, right? And that's the cool thing. Like everybody's sort of playing every, it's almost like every time someone has a turn, everybody potentially could get to play. So now I pass them to this player. That player may not be able to use them. If they can't, they pass them to the next player. Now that player may be able to use them and they'll act and they'll go ahead and use them and they may play a card in their hand. But if it goes all the way around and nobody can use them, those resources just go right back in the bag. Not in the discard pile, they go back in the bag. Now once the bag is empty, then you'll take the discard pile and put it in the bag. So that's how that works. Um, so I thought that was a really, really cool mechanic that you know on everybody's turn, other players get the potential opportunity to play cards in their hand and use resources. And there's actually cards you can activate to give yourself more resources. Um, and that's that's interesting as well because you might hold off on those and use them when it's not even the active player, that would be your turn. When it's not even your turn, you can get some resources passed to you. Maybe you activate a power that gives you another resource and now you're playing all kinds of cards, deploying troops and getting ready for the next round. And it's not even your actual turn yet. So. I think that's you know a really nice mechanic that's built into the game, and it makes it to where it's very interactive. It isn't like you take your turn, and then the next thing you know, it's like, okay, 10 minutes later, I can take a turn again. Like, you're always, and I'm not saying a, a round would take 10 minutes, because the game does move pretty fast, but you're always getting to interact and play. So that was a really nice add to this game and mechanic. Okay, then you're going to discard. So if there's any cards in your hand that you don't want, and you can discard all of them if you want. You can discard down. You can uh, get rid of quests that you don't particularly like and you want to request um, having that max of two. You can get rid of one, get rid of them both, whatever you want, and replace those quests. 
Uh, and then what you're going to do is after you've discarded, you're then going to draw back up to your hand limit, which generally will be five, unless you have a card that modifies that. And again, all players will draw back up to their hand limit. So again, as those resources were being passed around, if others were able to build or deploy uh, troops with those resources um, on anybody else's turn, they would have less than their hand limit, so that at that point in time, they would draw back up. So you can see that as it goes around the table, there may be multiple times that you're drawing back up and spending resources and doing things when it's not even your actual turn. I absolutely love that mechanic in this game. And then once it goes all the way around and it's to the last person, there's this really neat uh, little card here and it's a nice thick uh, cardboard and it's got its own special custom die. And what you're going to do, and you give this to the, kind of the last the last player around uh, the, the table. So we know once you get to the last, then it's time to roll. And that's the last thing that that individual will do. They'll pick up that die, and they'll roll that die. And there's one, two, three, four, five special symbols on this six-sided die. And you'll, you'll roll it, you'll get the symbol, and then you'll look at the symbol on this card, and some type of event will happen. Generally, something isn't, it isn't good. So like one of them is Ravage. Players with four or more troops destroy one. Ruin. Players with three or more buildings destroy one. Slay. Players with two or more heroes destroy one. Bioak, which is a special thing that's from the computer game. It's like this big, psychic, crazy storm that just takes stuff out. Players with one or more soul gems return one. And then the last one is a circle. It's called the Circle of Peace. There's no effect. So it's a one in six chance you'll get the circle of peace, which is uh, no effect to the game. All the other sides are going to give you something that isn't good. So I like that. You know, it's a way that you know if if you do a round where you get really really built up, it just is. It's a way to really offset the game and balance the game to make sure that you're always having to deal with something that you really weren't expecting. Like, ah, oh, I got the exact amount of troops that I want. I got two heroes, right? And then this thing rolls and you got to kill one of your heroes. Oh, here we go, right? Um, so, you know, it's just a way to kind of balance out the gameplay as you, as you play through the game. So that's it. That's Pillars of Eternity, the card game. Again, I absolutely love this card game. If you like games like Pathfinder the Adventure card game, Warhammer Quest the Adventure card game. This has a very similar feel. You can solo it, but it's not like Warhammer the or, or a game like that. It's not like Pathfinder. It's almost like you took all those games and combined them together. And that's kind of what it feels like. I mean, you get the dungeon crawl feel. You get the adventure feel. I love the fact how you can build up buildings and build up almost kind of like a little fort. I love the fact how you've got kind of a, a loot pile, and there's loot in the game that interacts with what you do. You can get pets. I mean, there's just so much going on, but yet it's still a very straightforward, simple card game. The only thing that might get a little overwhelming as you play is, let's look at this setup here for this player. There's a lot that's going to go on, and this is early game, okay? Now, the more there's player versus player combat, there's more that, you know, there's items that you have that get destroyed. You can have, for instance, up to uh, five in your army, so five army cards, five people, right, that are doing battle, but I've got a couple farms. Each one of those farms gives me an extra, so I'm up to seven, so I could potentially at one point have seven troops out on the, on the table. I can have up to nine buildings right now with this particular hero. So I can have nine different buildings that are out at one point in time. So you can see two quests. I have a loot pile. I've got some treasure and some loot that I got within the dungeon. So, you know, and that's out on the board. I've got my, my deck of cards. So that's the only thing that, I, that I've seen about this game or, or it feels like can be a little overwhelming. And I, I highly recommend that when you play, you get your own kind of custom layout of where you want your stuff. Like maybe you have all your troops on one side and all your buildings on another side. Or maybe you put all your troops up front in a line and all your buildings at the back in a line. And your, your main home base card in the center and maybe your quests off to the side of that and your loot off to the, uh, the other side of that. 
you you might want to try a, di a couple different and it gives you kind of a layout in the book but you may want to try like a couple different custom layouts to see what works best for you just in how you want to organize it because again there's a lot that's going on on those cards and when you go into combat and when you do various things you got to remember what's on those cards because those buildings that you build actually give you benefits when you go into combat uh, some of them do some of them do not so there's you know you really need to have a good purview on what's in front of you and you're reading those cards and you're knowing what is available to you when you go into combat with another player or a dungeon or anything in the game that's the only thing about this game that i would say uh, is any bit complex as there's a lot out in front of you going on other than that the actual rule set and the gameplay is very simplistic uh, and, and everybody will have the hang of it by the second round. Uh, it's just that easy. So I absolutely love this game. I'm going to be playing this game uh, a lot going forward, and I can see this consuming quite a bit of my game time. I've been playing this uh, with my daughter. She loves it. She's doing great playing. Got a 14 plus on it, but she's seven, and and, and she's doing great with it. She loves the game. We're having a great time. So. Good job, guys. I I definitely want to see expansion packs come out to this. You got to keep building on this system. It is a phenomenal game. If you run across this, it, the Kickstarter, we just got our games. Uh, but once this is in retail, if you run across it, pick up a copy. You won't be sorry. Hit that like. Hit the subscribe to join. This has been the McGuire Review, and we'll see you next time.